Okay, and we have, as promised, uh, Luca Albertini on the phone with us now from London. Uh, Mr. Albertini uh, has recently been appointed uh, just four days ago, I understand, as a managing director of Amlin. And uh, as we reported earlier in the week, is going to be working with Amlin as well as some others in developing an insurance link securities team. And uh, we're happy he's able to spend some time with us today. Luca, how are you? Thank you for doing this. Very well, and thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Let me, uh, let me just ask a question and uh, maybe get it out of the way at the beginning. Um, obviously, you were at Swiss Re for, for five years uh, working in uh, what initially was a, a very lucrative uh, venture for them with insurance link securities and obviously with the economic downturn and uh, uh, you, you've moved on and uh, we periodically see comments from Mr. Agron at Swiss Re when they're usually releasing their quarterly numbers about trying to work through some of the, the numbers uh, as a result of that. Can you, can you give us any indication as to what happened there and how you think that went? Uh, well, you know, I must say that the five years that characterized my, my stay there were uh, opposite direction for just the ILS industry, right? Mm -hmm. What we, uh, when I started the total outstanding, sorry, the total issuance per annum was about one billion. And uh, last year, uh, we have seen uh, over seven billion of uh, life and uh, seven billion of non-life being issued in total, with about 35 to 50 billion outstanding. So we saw a growing relevance of the capital markets I should say. Uh, in the industry, and uh, and that was before a major catastrophe. You know, just after a major catastrophe like Katrina and then uh, a few years uh, down the line, a couple of years down the line, even in, uh, in presence of spread compression or, or uh, premium compression in industry terms, uh, the, the market has been growing. Uh, the, so whatever happened uh, to, the, to the larger uh, Swiss Re, the company has always been very committed to the ILS strategy, and very supportive uh, of the team. And uh, you can see uh, the number of innovative structures that have been issued by our team uh, in uh, in last year. You know, we had uh, the first uh, Mexican quakes, we had the first Australian quake, we had the first Latin American uh, transactions, and uh, uh, and uh, sustained use of uh, capital markets both for Swiss reorganization purposes uh, and uh, to supplement our services to to the Swiss re clients. So. Uh, it has been fantastic, and uh, uh, clearly my decision to, to set up this uh, ILS uh, uh, activity here at Amelie has nothing to do with uh, Swiss Re, and uh, actually I, I think they will be doing even better, and I hope because I want to buy their, their paper. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, I, uh, I really was attracted by the idea after many, many years being on the structuring origination side uh, to uh, to set up something new and something that uh, will be an investor uh, or management company investing into uh, various insurance activities. And uh, to be a bit more precise, uh, we are now joining Amlin, and the reason why we join Amlin is that we'll be our seed investor. But our intention is to set up a management company, and once the uh, management company has all the required regulatory approvals in the UK, we will be transferring to those companies that will be partly owned by Amlin and partly by the management, and then the company will be managing uh, funds on behalf of Amlin and third-party investors. Right. So it's going to be a full-fledged buy-side um, company uh, buying insurance investment, whether in ILS mm -hmm. or uh, derivatives or uh, IRWs or collateralized insurance. So you uh, are going to be actively... Uh attracting investment money to come in to underwrite risks? Yes, so on one mm -hmm. side, yeah, we, we, uh, our chairman primarily, uh, Mr. John Wells, will be uh, out there trying to, to get uh, investors into our fund to give us money, mm -hmm. and uh, my primary role will be the one to monitor the investment opportunities in the market and, uh, and make uh, investments into one or more funds targeted at specific investors of ours. Well, let me ask you, uh, is, is this a uh, advantageous time to begin to start an endeavor like this, considering the, uh, the premium compression, as you refer to it, and the, uh, the abundance of capacity? Is this, uh, what do you think about that? 
you know, the reason why I think is the right time is uh, you really see um, a market that was very, very small and uh, almost an influential to mm-hmm. the capital markets into the into this sector has been growing now to relevance. And uh, in my last five years at Swiss Re, I really see how most of the primary companies that have uh, important reinsurance programs, they all want to also have a finger in the capital market for diversification purposes. I've seen a number of companies giving more and more value to collateral posted uh, alongside um, traditional reinsurance without collateral posting. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of buyers tapping uh, the capital markets via W and or, or uh, I would call last minute structures you know, in order to square their, their retrocession or, or insurance needs. Uh, and uh, and so uh, the size of this market relative to the total insurance market is still such where there is room for specialized players. Uh, up to last year, only 40% of the money invested into insurance and securities were coming from dedicated uh, funds buying uh, insurance and securities, the rest mm-hmm. were hedge funds, money market, institutional investors. What we would do is, uh, uh, you know, what I see is uh, a growing role of dedicated fund manager who only buy ILS every day rather than general uh, asset managers. And, uh, and I see this other money from other fund managers coming into those funds that know how to make these purchases. So um, us coming maybe not completely uh, increase the mm-hmm. total amount of money available, but maybe just uh, focusing some of the money through expert management um, uh, in, in ILS. Let me ask you two questions uh, as, as a result of what you just said. You mentioned the uh, collateralization. Um, and obviously you're aware of the discussions that have been going on in the United States uh, with a number of jurisdictions, New York and Florida uh, especially, uh, talking about loosening the collateralization requirements for for alien insurers and uh, how that's been wholeheartedly endorsed by Lloyds, uh, by Chairman Levine, Sean McGovern and others, as well as Sam Skinner over in the EU. Um, If that loosening uh, takes place uh, for accredited insurers, um, I, I suppose, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that wouldn't necessarily affect your industry because you're still going to be being required to post full collateralization in, in most events. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I guess that the collateralization uh, that is required by this type of, uh, uh, of the type of clients that uh, do market uh, collateralized layers is uh, simply for those who uh, want to mitigate the credit risk in their books. Mm -hmm. So you can clearly imagine that a major calamity could have an impact on the counterpart credit risk of a number of players, Mm -hmm. maybe not the the largest one, but a number of players who do provide insurance in the market. And uh, and so uh, uh, having collateral will be effectively buying protection on the secondary effect of the major calamity. I may be buying protection from a, say, uh, you know, triple B reinsurer or a single A reinsurer mm-hmm. uh, for Eurowind, and that that particular reinsurer may be uh, in, the, in uh, troubles because of a massive Japanese or, or California event. Mm-hmm. Still, even if I just bought Eurowind cover, right, I, I, I may struggle to recover my reinsurance if an event happens uh, following that event. If I need to come out of my reinsurance arrangement, assuming mm-hmm. I didn't pay all the premium up front, I may have to pay up in order to replace the, the provider. So uh, uh, also, if you look at the Solvency II criteria in Europe, mm-hmm. there will be capital posted against credit risk in the books. So simply, if you look at the total insurance receivable and recoverable in, in your in your uh, reinsurance uh, in your insurance strategy, having a portion which is collateralized uh, would uh, make uh, a more balanced risk uh, into into your whole pool and also allow you to uh, save some capital under the new solvency two rules. Let, let me uh, let me ask a little bit about the. Uh the kind of uh, structures uh, that these these ILSs uh, will assume. Presumably, if your uh, if your chairman is uh, attracting uh, new investors, uh, you're going to be looking for things perhaps a, l- a little bit less esoteric and, and more understandable to investors. And uh, I guess uh, 
or, or is the plan to stick with the low frequency events up at high levels, or are you uh, envisioning getting getting down and dirty, so to speak, uh, as Hillary Clinton would say, getting getting down and dirty and uh, getting into the main arena and uh, uh, beginning to play from the ground up insofar as coverage goes, since you're you're not shying away from full collateralization. I mean, how do you see that going? Is it a little bit of a balancing act between the investors and what's understandable to them? I, I think uh, this is why I mentioned earlier there may be one fund, there may be two funds. I mean, definitely I think uh, we, we do more than one fund over time. Mm -hmm. The question is whether we do them up front. Um, the uh, most remote layers are clearly for those uh, who have a different type of risk appetite. They like the return, but they don't want much risk. Uh, however, in this market, as you said at the beginning, they would have to accept a lower yield overall mm. in order to be able to uh, to get these players because um, uh, there has been a, a, a premium reduction uh, for U.S. parents that were driving a lot of these returns uh, as well as uh, some continental parents. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, there also will be a fund that attracts uh, the real, I mean, I, I wouldn't call them working layer, but uh, right. the, the riskier layer about the working layer. Right, right. The, those, structures, those structures are uh, being marketed at the moment. You have info, information. Mm -hmm. uh, you have some of those transactions being uh, now produced to us, and I can see layers, and I'm reading right now, with expected losses, 4% per annum. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do, do, do. Looking so another one as a 3.3, another one as 5 percent. So you do have you know pretty high risk layers, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a component uh, of your portfolio into these high risk layers, if the transaction is well structured by a prime uh, arrangement uh, banks, and uh, and uh, the underlying risk is sound, uh, would make sense mm -hmm. in a portfolio. Me, but clearly, clearly, uh, you know, it's a very simple uh, equation in order. In order to make sense, these uh, transactions uh, need to have a minimum, uh, a minimum size, and mm -hmm. uh, now in order to have and a minimum return as well, and to have those returns, you need to pump in more risk in order to achieve those returns. Well, as we, as we talk about pumping in more risk to achieve returns, that uh, let me let me take the position of what a uh, I guess a traditional reinsurance uh, underwriter might say, um, who's very conservative and. and would not necessarily be interested in going near the capital markets. Um, have these instruments been tested yet? Have investors uh, who, when they read the boilerplate language, uh, warning them that they not only could run the risk of losing interest, but can also run the risk of losing principal, have any of these uh, insurance-linked securities actually ended up uh, having lost the principal yet? Yes, yes, we have. I mean, the most. Uh uh, there is one which is uh, officially has officially lost uh, uh, principle, mm -hmm. and that is a transaction called Campri, mm -hmm. transaction structured by Swiss Re for the benefit of Zurich Financial Services, and was triggered by the Katrina Wittstone. Mm -hmm. uh, transaction was an indemnity basis. It took some time to pay, simply because these structures pay a claim to the protection buyer only when the losses are paid by the primary insurer. Mm -hmm. the uh, insurer. Let me, may I interrupt you? The, you said Swiss Re. Was that one of the ones that you worked on? Not personally. It was uh, the team in the United States. Okay. All right. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, All yeah, right. there was, uh, we, the Swiss Re. has a team in the U.S. and one in Europe, and this was done in, in the United I, States. I guess my ultimate question was, uh, uh, what, what was the reaction of the investors? Was there a lot of... Uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth, or uh, was it a recognition that, well, okay, sometimes you will lose some, but mainly you're going to win some? The reaction of investor is a, you know, a lot of conversation we cannot, we cannot mm -hmm. disclose, but uh, was, uh, I would say, squarely in your second scenario, mm -hmm. and uh, to actually put data around this, after Katrina, after Camp Reed, uh, was clearly a total write-off, and this was clear uh, in the weeks, in the few weeks after Katrina. Um, we had the a record issuance the following year in the industry. So, really? uh, I would say almost all of the investors, with the exception of two in my recollection, uh, invested into new insurance lien securities, having lost money uh, in uh, in Campri. Uh, clearly, uh, Campri was uh, sorry, Katrina was such a big event mm -hmm. that no one could dispute. Oh, I didn't know I bought Winston Reed. <laughs> no, good uh, point. It, uh, you know, actually, people, I would say, 
market were wondering why Katrina did not respond, and the only answer is is that the, the trajectory of that uh, particular event was not in the area where people buy most protection to cut bonds, and people buy more protection on Florida than uh, on the area affected by Katrina. So, so clearly, clearly, uh, you know, we had the other questions like, how come Sony came free? Mm-hmm. Uh, but then there have been other sources of losses. There is another transaction which is rumored to be triggering, although. Uh, being one for four a and not being you know official that has triggered, I cannot really talk mm-hmm. about it. Uh, uh, but uh, a, a number of other uh, investors may have lost money. Actually, uh, have indeed lost money in what we call mount to market. These are multi-year securities, and their and their value moves every week. And uh, a lot of investors have to uh, show the value of their investment. On mm-hmm. And uh, these investors be security. So it, it could have happened, and has happened, that people bought a security worth $100, mm-hmm. and then they sold it for $99 after one year, one month, or, 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 or two years, right? And uh, uh, so there are a number of ways in which investors have made and lost money in insurance in securities, and up to now we haven't seen any, uh, any incident in, uh, in these processes, whether losses from investors or, or disgruntled investors or anything. Clearly... Uh, you know, some people uh, entering into this market, losing money at a very early stage, then they said, look, maybe that was exactly what the, the, market, the, the, the cover said, uh, but I realize I'm not an expert, so I want to withdraw. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why, that's why I, I find value of setting up venture like ours, because uh, you may recognize Armin as one of the best on the right team in the London, and uh, we want to borrow from that expertise. When you buy, you know, one in 50-year parametric cover, you may just do it on the on the back of offering circular risk analysis. Mm-hmm. When you buy a 5% expected loss indemnity transaction, you want to have a conversation with expert underwriters, and that's what uh, we we're planning to do to add value uh, into the into the sector. Well, you'll certainly be able to do that with the uh, with the Amlin team, that's for sure. Their underwriting unit is very respected. So. Yeah, and I mean, believe me, uh, nobody is, is interested in seeing any investor lose money, but I can imagine that uh, if you're talking with a prospective uh, sedent or, or a buyer, uh, that question ultimately will come up, uh, what is your track record on payouts? So uh, I, I suppose in a perverse way, it's actually uh, reassuring. Um, right. let, me, uh, let me just ask you one final question or two. Uh, why, uh, why London? Um, this is pretty new for them, don't you think? Uh, are, you, are you running into any uh, reaction from uh, Lloyd's itself, the entity? Uh, what is what is uh, Mr. Ward saying, if anything? Uh, oh, I haven't talked to him mm-hmm. personally. Uh, I mean, no, they, they, we are, at least uh, to my knowledge, the third headed uh, funding. Uh, uh, one uh, will set up some seed money from uh, from. Uh, uh, Swiss Re, and uh, another one uh, is uh, is being the first to be established here. It's a, you know, the, it's not the fund, sorry, it's mm-hmm. a management company. So the management operates out of London. The funds can be in other jurisdictions. Uh, the question of uh, you know why uh, why uh, an Amlin would do something like this, and therefore within the Lloyd's uh, uh, the Lloyd's market is the first. Uh, then clearly, clearly for them is this is a recognition. Of, I would say for us, no, not for them. Mm-hmm. For us, at Amling, is this is the recognition that the capital markets are more and more uh, re- relevant and material play uh, for the reinsurance clients and the primary insurance clients. Mm-hmm. So what, uh, what, first of all, is an education process to be close to people who can uh, monitor and explain these processes to them from inside. Second thing is to make uh, some selected investments that could complement their risk appetite. So uh, clearly they're not going to put a material amount of money at risk from the asset side, but if there are investments that uh, could be palatable for the risk appetite uh, and plug their gap, um, some gaps, then they mm-hmm. would be very happy to, to make an investment directly. And then uh, by putting some seed into our activity, they will be able to make money again from the funds and at the same time earn uh, fees uh, through their interest into the management company. So that would enhance their return. So it's a transfer of knowledge, ability to use the capital markets mm-hmm. either as protection by or protection seller, 
mm-hmm. and uh, also increasing the, the source of uh, fee income and on top of uh, premium income and fee income, as you say, being uh, less risky uh, as a different uh, PE implication for a company. There probably uh, would be a, uh, an appetite here for a secondary market on, uh, on these as well, wouldn't you think? On, on the insurance and securities? Or yes, the yes. Yes, no, the is are pretty active. I mean, last year, Swiss 3 alone uh, traded about 1.8 billion of, uh, of uh, ILS in secondary market. Did they really? And, uh, yes, and uh, so uh, it, is, it is a market where it is very easy if you need to sell. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of the market appetite of risk, uh, if you want to buy, say, 100 million of risk and you do it in the secondary market, you may struggle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason is simply that people that have good bonds, they want to hold to them unless they really have to sell. Mm-hmm. So that uh, you know, lack of willingness to sell um, is a uh, market. What does happen a lot, though, is uh, what we call switches. Mm-hmm. So I give you some of my quick and you give me some of your U.S. wind. Where, where, where do you where where is uh, where is the marketplace for these switches? Where do you do this? He basically, investors either do it directly or they do it through the dealers that have led uh, the transactions they want to trade. Ah. So say that you bought a, a a bond from Swiss Re, then uh, you are likely to call Swiss Re primarily on that particular trade. Say, okay, mm-hmm. you know everybody else who bought this bond mm-hmm. because you were the seller, mm-hmm. right? Correct. Right. Uh, uh, any of them want to buy some more, uh, and uh, or you know uh, they, they call other dealers in order to check that the price is adequate, and uh, and uh, and uh, make sure that uh, the, uh, you know they, they get the best value. Uh, although I would say there is now about three, four, five dealers that uh, do this on a pretty frequent basis. This would be a, a perfectly uh, suitable entity for trading on an exchange. Yeah, but there are there are about four exchange initiatives, mm-hmm. uh, but there are exchanges, uh, on this exchange you buy the, the primary risk now, uh, to trade the securities, I guess, because also the 144 in nature, um, sometimes is, um, is also not possible to use exchanges. Oh. Okay. Well, Luca, we, uh, we thank you for your time, and uh, we, we certainly are going to be following this very closely. When do you think, uh, what's the time frame for FSA approval? Have they given any indication? Uh, no, no, no. I mean, I, I mean, uh, Italian and superstitious. I don't say yeah. anything. So <laughs> but uh, I really, I really hope uh, to to be notifying the public with the name, uh, you know, uh, before the winter. So. <laughs> well, that that would be good. Well, we'll uh, we'll stop in and see you the next time we're in London, and uh, we we will definitely keep in touch and hope to talk to you again. Thank you very much. Well, thank thank you for your time. And now we'll we'll move on to our next story.